Hello, everyone. Welcome to CyberSight webinar. It's a delight to have you here today on a Monday morning or a Monday afternoon, if whether you are. Uh, I would like to thank CyberSight for the invitation. Thank you for having the time to listen to me. We are going to talk a little bit about critical lens technology in glaucoma, in diagnosing and in treating glaucoma. If you have any questions, please do write in your Zoom uh, message uh, message part down on the bottom. So uh, I have no financial interest here. However, some of the images were provided by Volk. So um, by the end of this lecture, we are going to understand and master the use of different lens. Uh, for clinical exam. So we are going to talk about a little bit about fundus exam, the gonioscopy exam, and how to use lenses to treatment. So laser procedures and surgical gonioscopy view. Uh, so the first question for the poll is, for diagnosing glaucoma, which are the first two exams that you should perform first? OCT and visual field, eye pressure, IOP, and visual field, IOP and OCT, or D, fundus exam and gonioscopy. Say what you usually do. Don't say what you think it's right. Then you can, we, have a, we can have a better understanding of what's happening around the world. We get most of the people, 40% fundus exam and gonioscopy, OCT, 10% and IOP and visual fields 40%. Great, that's a great, uh, great answer. We are going to talk a little bit now in the lecture. Okay, so when you see this, uh, what's the million dollar question when you see a picture like this? Is this a man or a woman? Victor, what are you talking about? We are in a glaucoma lecture. What kind of question is this? I know by your answer, some people see OCT first. Some people do visual field first. Nowadays, we have a lot of technology and some people pr prefer doing OCT instead of fundus exam. Because, because fundus exam is not easy to perform. There are many details to see and some patterns are difficult to see. To see. And what we know from from some studies that you can predict sex from retinal fundal photographs. What I want to say by that is that deep learning can recognize patterns that we humans can't. And that's why it's so important the fundal exam. It, gives, it can give you much more characteristics of the disease than we still think. So, uh, fundus exams is still a major glaucoma exam. It may predict the future of the disease. It may, may be key for treating communities and you should master. And we are going to help you to do so today. Uh, what's the importance? Uh, fundus can set the stage of the disease and by comparing one exam to one few years after you can define how aggressive your treatment is going to be. And another very important exam is gonioscopy. Why? Because gonioscopy, gonioscopy is going to define the condition of the pipes. Remember that glaucoma is some kind of pipe disease. For some reason, there is an imbalance between production and drainage of aqueous so the pressure goes up so it's a pipe problem and if it's a pipe problem we have to see which pipe and how we can fix these pipes and the pipes here basically is the trabecular meshwork so how do we do fundus exam first of all you have you sitting in front of the patient and there is a light source from your slit lamp there is the condensing lens and the patient eye but how does it actually work? So during the, uh, the bio exam, you, you hold the lens, the condensing lens just before the eye. And this condensing lens is going to stay a few millimeters. We are going to see just soon after away from the eye. And the purpose of this lens is to gather the light from the coming eye that is 
it had like a div right divergent light due to the power of the cornea and the lens. And this lens is going to present a real image. However, this real image is going to flip and it's going to invert uh, to the other side and the opposite direction. How does it really work? It gives you a real inverted image. And how does it work for you to understand what you're seeing? So this is the starting image, uh, the real image in the retina. So you get the image inverted. So if here is 12 and here's a six, the 12 go downwards and the six go upwards. However, it also gets reversed. So it goes from the three o'clock comes to here and the six o'clock to the other. And what you get is a completely indirect image. It's completely the opposite. So in a real world, what, what do you see? If you see left, right, up, down, you are going to see down, up, go by the color, right and left. And it's difficult to see and to actually write down what you're seeing. So one way I find very easy is to draw. And how you're going to draw? This is what we use in clinics to make easier. We have a, uh, a drawing, a setting, and this is divided into 10 little squares. Why 10 little squares? Because then you can draw and go from zero to 10, like the cupping ratio that you can have in the clinics. And you're just going to draw whatever you see and see it's upside down. Why it's upside down? Because if you draw what you actually seen and then you just flip the paper, you're going to get the real image. So this can be tricky. So let's see if let's take this as an example. You can see here the paper, right? OS. Instead of looking like this, you're going to flip and you are going to draw. By drawing what you're seeing, once you finish, you can flip the paper and you get the real image. The same image you can compare to your drawings. You can compare to your pictures. This really helps. And what kind of lenses do you have, of condensing lenses you have? You have many kinds of lenses. And what's going to differentiate one from the other is the field of view, the magnification you get, and the working distance. Um, so here we have some difference between them. So here are the lenses that I usually use in clinics. So you can see I use uh, one that can take a wider field of view and one can give you a bigger magnification. And we are going to see the details in one minute. So here comes the second question. What's lip lamp fundus lens promotes the higher magnification of the image and has a correcting factor of one, the 20, the 66, the 78, or the 90 diopters lens. That is real, really interesting. So basically, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the results. Uh, we have a draw here. Basically, all of them gives you a uh, one factor and have the same magnification. So the lecture today is for you. We are going to understand what is happening. Okay, so the, what is magnification? Magnification is how much the, the image you're seeing gets bigger, gets magnified. So if, if uh, magnification factor is two times, as you're going to see, it means that the image that is in the retina gets two times bigger when you see it. So the higher the magnification, the easier it is to see the optic nerve characteristics. On the other hand, uh, the field of view is how much you see from the retina. So the wider the view, the more you can see. And this is very good for seeing retina and for seeing, for instance, scars in the retina. The difference is that the ones which gives you the wider view 
you can do with undilated pupil. And the ones that give you a um, bigger or higher magnification, sometimes you have to dilate the, the pupil. So let's understand here. So basically what I have shown you is the ones that I use. I use the digital wide field, the 78 and the super 66. What's the difference between them? If you see here, the higher the power or the higher the diopter, less the, less the image magnification or in the other words, not so big, the less the working distance, but wider the field, as you are going to see in a minute. And the Super 66 has the higher magnification, one. On the other hand, that the least uh, VF, uh, field of view. And this is good for glaucoma. Why? Because here I can see all the characteristics of the nerve, while here you can see, but not so much. So let's compare. Here I'm seeing the same nerve with different lenses. So here you can see, um, it was a video, but you can compare the three differences between what you're seeing of the nerve. So see here the 66, here the 71, and here the white field one. So with one you can see more the characteristics, the other you can see more of the field. Does it make a difference? It can make a difference, especially if it's not dilated, but it can make a difference to see some of the nerve characteristics. And how what, what you see when you see a, a, a nerve? So to see it better, what you can also use, it's to use the magnification factor of your slit lamp. So if in case you're using uh, 90, diopters lens for instance you can you can just increase the magnification here and you get the increased image however the higher you increase here the more light you need to see the nerve and this can be troublesome for some patients because you need a lot of light the bigger the magnification here so you really have to during during your practice see what works best best for you um okay so here we are going to see the magnif uh, the slip lamp magnification so here are some difference between them um here you can see the difference between this first uh this first um lens which is the 90 lens then to compare with the 78 you can you can see that the 91 gives you a much bigger uh, field of view uh, so how to perform the exam first of all we're going to put some num uh, numbing drops then why numbing drops we are not touching anything but by putting numbing drops you take out the reflex of the eye and the patient with the right eye won't feel much. You start with a low light. Uh, you put a very narrow sl uh, slit of light in front of you. Then you're going to place your fingers. I prefer to place the fingers in the slit lamp and in the forehead and just hold the lens like this. Why that? Because I'm going to take like a model, for example. If you place here, you know if the patient's going backwards or stay in the right place, the patient can, can feel your hand. So it's kind of, he feels safer if you, if he places his hands on, uh, if he, if you place your hands on his forehead and you can actually have like a more stable lens for you to do the exam. Um, and then you're going to increase the light very slowly and ask the patient to to look to your nose, so always point to where, where he has where he has to to look. Therefore, uh, you can find the nerve better. Dilate. Should you dilate? Depends. I usually dilate in the first exam when you are getting to know the patient, 
Why? Because then you can see the whole retina. I personally use my 20 diopter lens in general for seeing the whole retina and a 66 lens to see the details. Why? Because I live in a poor country. In a poor country, you have a lot of toxo, and sometimes patients can have toxo scars. And if they have a scar close by the macula, it can give you uh, 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 some kind of height or some kind of, uh, of, of things that may look like glaucoma. So remember, the slit lamp, even the night, doesn't replace the 20 diopters uh, bio exam. So how to perform the exam? Some pearls. First of all, there is always a correct side. And some lens, there are there is like a white stripe here. And then when there is a white stripe, it should be facing the patient. Others doesn't have a right stripe, so you use the V of the Vogue, just like an arrow. This should be towards the patient. So the V, like an arrow, should be pointing the patient. And always rest your arm uh, and don't don't just stay like don't just stay like this with yours with your lens because you won't have too much balance. I personally use the box to give it stable. And to avoid glare, what you do, you just flip the lens like this. So sometimes you can have glare. You just keep doing like this and uh, the glare will go away. So what we, are, we are realized uh, from, from COVID is that people are wearing masks. And when they wear masks, you might have some humidity here. So what you can do you simply place your finger on the mask and this will avoid the respiration coming up and you will have a clear view. When you use more than one lens, what is very helpful is to have different colors for each lens. So having each color for a different lens like I have here, in a dim light situation, you can know which one is the white field, which one is the 66. It makes just quicker to, to do the exam. This is very simple, but it really helps during the, during the exam. Um, and how to see the size of the nerve. So you are going to put like a very slight thin slit of light. And by using this part of this lit lamp, you can actually measure the beam. So you, it, it, it's going to increase and decrease, and you are going to see what number you have here. So you can actually measure, as you can see here, and by measuring, then you, you need like a correct uh, to correct this factor. So let's take an example. If you're using a, six, a 78 diopters Volk lens, you are going to multiply whatever you see by 1.1. So if you see a 1.4 millimeters nerve, you are going to uh, multiply by 1.1 if using a 78 Volk lens. If you're using a 90 diopters one, you are going to multiply by 1.3. And why is this important? Because different nerves or different size of nerves give you different cupping. So what do we know that everyone has the same amount or almost the same amount of ganglion cells. So if you have a bigger eye and imagine if you have a hundred ganglion cells and you and you're have a big eye, you are going to have a normal excavation. You can, you're going to have a bigger excavation. However, if you have a small eye, all these ganglion cells are going to be condensed in one small hole. So the, the, the cupping should be much smaller. So the first thing is to measure and to know if it's large or a small disc, because this can vary uh, according to the cupping. And then you are going to evaluate the differences between uh, the, the nerve and to, and to actually see, uh, 
know what you are seeing, what I suggest is to read these five rules to evaluate the optic disc, or either see another cyber, cyber site webinar from Paul Singh, where he explains each of the one very nicely. This is difficult. It needs time you have to see. The more you see and the more you draw, the more you get used to it and the more detail you are going to realize with time. So what I usually do, all the things that I have to see that ref refers to glaucoma, I have written down in one paper. Why? Because when, once I draw, I can see what I'm seeing and then I can write down. And by the end, I know everything that I have seen. Because sometimes it can be kind of troubleshooting by the time you go to your uh, to your record, you, you won't remember. And one thing is very difficult and you should with green light is the to, to check the RNFL. So the RNFL, as you can see here, has a height, what it means it's kind of darker. This is very difficult to see in real life, even if we're using the red, the red, uh, the green light. So this is even better seen if you take pictures afterwards. And why are fundus exam important? Because you can compare with time. So this is a two, 2005 picture, still printed in paper. And this is a newer one from 2022. So here you can compare if it has progressed it has progressed or not different from oct oct is good yeah it's great but sometimes every 10 years after 15 years the technology changes completely and you can't actually compare one exam to the other so fundus exams and pictures are still very important uh, uh, and more important than that is that Medeiros, in one study, from pictures, he could estimate the RNFL thickness. So see how AI is helping us in, in Fundus exam. And more than that, nowadays we have some handheld uh, devices which can take pictures. And what you can do, you can do a screening in your practice. And when the patient comes, you, have, you can have the picture and compare to what you see and what's different. A picture is great because it's there. But when you do this little lamp exam, you actually can see in 3D. So you can see if it's tilted, if it's not tilted, you can see better the vessels. So you can complement what you see the, to the picture. So take the picture and run and write on top of it what you see in real life. And more than that, um, in some distant or isolated populations, you can use it as a screening tool. Um, so I'm from Brazil. In Brazil, we have many places which are in the middle of the forest. And using such uh, devices can be very helpful. And especially nowadays. So this is a program for, from Volk. Uh, you can take the picture of the machine and the picture goes straight to a place with experts and the experts can reveal what you, the picture that someone has taken, like a technician, for instance, and it can write down, for instance, if it's glaucoma, if it's not, if you should, if you should treat, if you should not. And more than that, I know if you know, but there's CyberSight has a great program for undeveloped uh, countries. Uh, or if you live in undeveloped countries, it's an AI-based program, which you can upload um, the fundus image, and it's and and this AI program in seconds is going to tell you if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's for instance is it's abnormal or if it's not abnormal. If it's glaucoma, if it's not glaucoma, it's still under development, but it's great, even especially for distant places. So now we are going to the second part of the lecture, which is clinical gonioscopy exam. So here comes the third question. 
which is which of the fallen lens is most using during dynamic gonioscopy. The Goldman lens, the form mirror high mag lens, form mirror flange lens, or six mirror. I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, great. So here we have a very interesting result, which 45% say the Goldman lens and 35% say the four mirror high mag lens. And so this lecture is for you and we are going to talk about it. Um, so why is gonioscopy important? If you don't pay attention, you may think this is the trabecular meshwork. However, if you indent with using your gonio lamps, you are going to see the trabecular meshwork is actually hidden from what we're seeing. And what's the problem? Because in surgery, you could place a stent in a wrong position. So let's take this as an example. So note what's happening here. I'm pressing using a four mirror one, and I'm pressing so much that I can actually see the corneal folds. And when I press it, I see that, that there is a nice stand hidden. So this was basically put in a wrong, not in a wrong position, but in an eye that shouldn't have put because it's actually blocking the eye stand. So uh, when you see corneal folds, and you press hard, you, you press hard to see the angle. So here is just as curiosity seeing the eye stand, which was hidden in, in a closed angle. Uh, so in clinics, before doing surgery, always write down or take the uh, picture of the nasal view of what you see during the gonio um, going exam. So surgical gonioscopy is key for surgical success. If you master it, you can do any kind of mix surgery. But then you're going to tell, I only do traps. I don't do surgery at all. Why do I need to know all that? Because you may uh, encounter these situations. And what should you do in these situations? We are going to talk about it. You may go for laser, you may go for surgery. And how can you define if this is open, this is closed, if it has any anomalies, and how you're going to follow up the treatment. Um, so you should master gonioscopy even if you don't do surgery or even if you are a general ophthalmologist. So for gonioscopy, you have two key concepts, location, knowing where the trabecular meshwork is, and visualization, having a good gonio view. And the key thing is to find where the sclerospur is, the white part, and where the trabecular meshwork is. And there are many courses which you can do uh, in the web. You can do the wool glaucoma uh, course from the website. You can use gonioscopy.org. You can go to AAO and actually see it with more details. But basically, uh, how does gonioscopy work? So, you do have a light coming. Why can't you see like you, you, you don't see in, in a fundus exam? Because the light which comes from the image gets totally reflected from the tear film. And this is called total internal reflection. When the, the light reflecting off the horizontal junction hits the tear film. And that's why you need a gonioscopy lens. And that's why all gonioscopy lens are going to actually touch the cornea because by touching the cornea, the light won't get totally reflected and you are going to see. So the lens overcome the total internal reflection and redirects the eye from the angle to the observer eye. Um, so this is a direct gonioscopy. A direct gonioscopy is a steeply convex lens, which uh, the, the, the light will exit the eye closer to the perpendicular at the interface. On the other hand, the indirect go, uh, gonioscopy lens will use mirrors to overcome the internal reflection. And this you are going to sit up up here to, to see. So, um, 
when using the indirect view, you are going to sit in front of the lens, and that's why you are going to see all uh, reflected or inverted, while the direct view one, you, you can't use it in clinics because see how the light will come up. You'll have to stay down here. And that's why one of the reasons why a direct uh, lens is used during surgery. However, even the microscope has to be tilted. And that's why you have all this preparation to do a uh, 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 mix surgery, for example. That's why, and now you understand why you have to tilt the eye to one direction and the microscope to the other direction. And that's why when you use uh, during surgery, an indirect lens, it's very difficult to see because you can actually sit in a good position. You don't have to tilt, as you know, but all the image is going to be inverse. So how do you see in, in gonioscopy? And that's very difficult. And this is one of the most important parts of the lecture today. So it's different from what you see in fundus exams. So here is your starting image. Here is your image is inverted. And this is what you see in gonioscopy. Different from fundus, uh, uh, fundus image, you have six o'clock and 12 o'clock. But the six, uh, the nine o'clock stays in position and three o'clock stays in the original position. So in this sense, if you make these marks on the drawings, what you're going to see in the mirror here it's actually like this. So when it's exactly in the opposite direction, it stays the same, just inverted or flipped. And but the image here stays the same. Here, 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 and here. What this means is uh, so here I'm using a four mirror lens. So the easiness of this is because you don't have to actually rotate the the, the lens yeah so let's see here how it works so if you're looking sideways here you are looking here one two three however however if you rotate a little bit what actually happens is this four you're going to see in the other direction five goes just after four and six so see when you follow here it doesn't go like you expected like here but it flops from here to here so this is very important when doing laser for instance so when you are doing a laser uh, the laser goes like this and then you rotate and it goes like this so in this situation, you may over treat or even miss some place here. So what types of lenses do we have to use in the daily routine? You have the three mirror one, which is the most traditional one, the four mirror ones, and the six mirror ones. And here you can see one basic uh, difference between them. Here you have to rotate because you only have one working mirror. Here you have four, so you sometimes do have to rotate, but just very slight. And the six mirror ones give you a whole idea of the angle. So the three mirror ones is one of the oldest and most traditional one. It's used to see the interior chamber. It has three uh, mirrors. But only one mirror is made to see the angle, which is the small one. So if you see, there is a smaller um, mirror, and this is the one which sees the gonio, uh, which sees the, the gonio exam. And all the others is for retina, which I won't, uh, won't talk, uh, talk much. But you have to rotate to see different places. And this is also known as the Goldman lens. So here are some differences between some gold, uh, gold or some three mirror lens. The one I'm showing to you is the three mirror ANF plus. This is a very nice lens. It gives you a magnification one, not all six. 
And this is specifically, you don't need to put a coupling agent, but it's always good to put a little bit just to make easier and to have a nicer view. But most of them, they have a contact diameter, a wider contact diameter. And that's why you need some coupling agent. This is can give you a good image, but can be sometimes not so easy to use and for some eyes can be difficult. Um, this is another lens, which is the four mirror lens, uh, which all the mirrors are angled at 64 uh, uh, degrees. This is only meant to see the, the anterior chamber. And it just need very little rotation. Sometimes you can go with your slit lamp one from one mirror to the other, making life much easier. And it's also known as the Sussman lens. And, and this is one of the key aspects here. This is the lens when it doesn't have a flange that you use for dynamic uh, gonioscopy. And what is dynamic gonioscopy is when you can indent. We are going to talk a little bit about it. So here, see, uh, it doesn't have a flange and some people like to use the handle. Some people doesn't like to use the handle. I personally don't like to use the handle because then I can rotate in my hands and I feel much uh, safer doing this way. It doesn't fall down. Um, the difference between the flanged and no flanged is because the flanged one has, uh, uh, you, you do have to put a little bit of, uh, of a uh, coupling agent here, which can be uh, OVD or can be even some kind <clears throat> of uh, gel. And but this one you cannot indent because it's resting in the whole sclero and the whole cornea. Well, this one is not resting. You can actually press it. Um, so he, let's see the difference here. So here I'm using a very small eye. This is a plus 14 patient. Uh, see how difficult it is to, to place a three mirror lens because it's a much bigger diameter eye. While in the right hand side, it's a four mirror four mirrors lens, which is much easier to, <clears throat> to place the, the lens. And see here the difference here, I'm putting a, a flange uh, for mirror ones. It stays very nicely and gives you a very nice view. However, it does need as well some coupling agent. And when it does need a coupling agent, sometimes you can have bubbles in it. If you do have bubbles, tell, tell your patient to look up and just do this movement that the bubble will come out um, and the no flange one gives you less stability the flange one will st it sticks to the eye the non-flange one won't stick to the eye so you just have to be careful because more difficult you, you just have to really hold your position there um, and why is the four mirror so important? Because you can do dynamic gonioscopy. On other words, you can do indentation. And why do you do indentation? Because of angle closure glaucoma. So just reminding what's angle closure glaucoma. So here you produce your uh, aqueous humor. It goes, it goes all the way between the iris and the lens, go through the pupil, and it gets drained by the trabecular meshwork. When you have some kind of angle closure, something is happening that this aqueous can get here, can't get here, and the main uh, and the main reasons for that is the pupil, what we call pupil block. It has this concave, uh, this concave shape. You can have cataracts or increased lens, or even the ciliary body can be anteriorized. And here is what we usually see. So here, uh, usually you have pupil block, pato iris, 
the lens and even posterior causes. So let's see, let's revise what we see here. So here we are seeing the sclerospur, the trabecular meshwork, uh, which is the pigmented and non-pigmented, and more here, the Schwalbe's line. So just remembering, remembering cornea, trabecular meshwork, and the iris here. So this is very important. When you do your exam, one of the first things to do is try to find the two lines of the cornea, the anterior and the posterior line of the cornea, because when where they meet is where Schwalbe's line is. And this is important because sometimes, like in the previous example, you, might, you may think it's the trabecular meshwork. So how do you do in the, the indentation? You make press a little bit and when you press a little bit all this is going to go down and you're going to see the angle or some people advise just to move the eye or the lens up or down but when you do that this you're not actually indenting you are just seeing a different uh, perspective and that's why it's important to have always straight because if you have straight you you what you see is it's the reality if you if your lens is not really straight sometimes you can call an open angle a, a actually closed angle so here is another example of uh where the two cornea meet so here you can see the two lines and the two lines are meeting here this is Schwalbe's line and you can actually see the depression here this is the depression so it has some kind of plateau iris and here may be the cellular body and the crystalline and the lens and in the in, in the in the tension gonioscopy what do you do you press and when you press here see what's happening the angle opens you can actually see behind uh, the iris all the trabecular meshwork and this can be done by pressing the lens or even by even by switching on the lights so careful when you do your your exam because if there are a lot there are a lot of lights the pupil will constrict and then you get a open a open uh, a open angle so in this example, as you can see, you can see the a plateau iris. So seeing the ciliary body, how it's anteriorized and a bigger uh, lens. So here you see the plateau iris, the double hump. And this double hump, and now you understand what you're seeing in the gonioscopy. And like in this example, what happens if when I dent, I don't see the trabecular meshwork? This means it's closed, it's totally closed. And different from the other examples, here you may have to go straight to surgery. On the other examples, if you indent and you can see the trabecular meshworks, you may go to surgery, you may go to laser. And why all the films that I'm showing you are so dark? Because gonioscopy has to be done in the dark and why see this film here see what happens when i switch on the light when i switch on the light all the angle opens so this is a ubm and as, as you can see here see when the light comes the purple constricts and the angle opens um, and as i've told before if you can't really do it, or sometimes you don't have a Sussman lens, you can ask the patient to look a little bit towards one of the mirrors, and then you can see an uh, open uh, trabecular meshwork. And how do you write down? There are many ways to write down as the space classification, as the EGS classification, but what you have to see during the exam is these five characteristics, and write down the way you think is best for you where the iris is implanting. And if you do indentation, if you can see more, so for instance, I can only see Schwalbe's line. If I indent, can I see the trabecular meshworks? Yes, I can. So you write down like this. Why? Because it means you can do, uh, uh, you can do laser 
iridot uh, to me. Uh, so you can say how much the angle is formed. You can say the configuration of the iris, if it's concave, if it's flat, if it's plateau. You can say the pigment pigmentation. Sometimes uh, when you have too much pigment, like three plus, four plus, it usually has some kind of disease and some extra findings as synechia or neovascular. And you can actually draw what you see. So here are just some examples what you can see in your daily practice. Write, all, write down all your findings because it makes life much easier for you. So some suggestions for gonioscopy. Do a gonioscopy in dim light. Uh, use the anterior and posterior slit to see Schwalbe's line. Begin with a three mirror and then afterwards change for a four mirror ones. And follow the iris, the angulation, and then do the indentation. So now we are going to go to the second part of the lecture. It's much quicker now, don't worry. And we are going to talk about laser procedures. And here comes uh, the first poll. According to this representation, what, what is the most likely laser to be performed? The redotomy, the iridoplasty, the SLT, or the ALT. Okay, so most people, 58% say it's the SLT, and few of them say it's iridotomy. So we are going to go through it. So let's talk. We, I'm going to talk a little bit more for the SLT about the SLT and then the others. The whole idea of this presentation is for you to make a screenshot. So do a screenshot and carry with you. Then whenever you have to do a laser, you already know, and you have all, all the uh, cheat sheets uh, to use. So basically here is where the drainage is from the trabecular meshwork. Uh, remembering that here, glaucoma basically is a clog in the, in the, in the pipes, right? So the SLT is going to clean all this uh, these pipes here and the more you clean the more it's going to work so it, that's what we, we see here if you do a 360 degrees it actually as good as a, a prostaglandin so when you do SLT always goes for 360 instead of 180 in with few exclusions so it's SLT is the first line treatment for open angle glaucoma why because you have a hundred percent adhesion to the treatment you can use to add a drug or to substitute one drug if the patient has dry eyes and especially if the patient is going to start glaucoma treatment always try to start with SLT why because it's much easier to for the patient and it's uh, uh, and easier for you because you know the patient will be uh, using, uh, will be treated. Remember, patients, 50% of them, they use drugs. The other 50, they lie about using drugs. So do do the SLT. It's, you have 100% of them, they are a different. And, and how does the SLT works? Basically, you use a gonial lens, an indirect gonial lens, and you're going to do one shot right after the other. So it has to be one, one, then the other, then the other, then the other. This is going to make some kind of inflammation in the trabecular meshwork, which is going to call for mastocytes. And these mastocytes, they are going to rearrange the whole trabecular meshwork. And by rearranging, it's kind of unclogging the meshwork. And then it's going to drain much better. And it's very different from the ALT. So the SLT is kind of a fixed spot, which you go above the iris, taking the whole thing right here. And you're going to go one right after the other. While the ALT, on the other hand, is a mechanical, uh, you make like a mechanical hole. 
So here is you have disruption. Here you don't have disruption. It's a reorganization. And that's why we prefer nowadays SLT. So here's the difference. Here you see no difference in the meshwork. So probably it's just reorganized. Here is the ALT, a hole. And what do you think? The more holes you make, the more uh, scar you'll have and probably in the future won't work as good. And SLT, on the other hand, can be repeated. We know it can last for five years, so it can be repeated. And how do we do it? First of all, we are going to prepare the patient. And to prepare the patient, you I personally use pilocarpine, bremonidine, and measure the IOP before. I wait 40 minutes, and then we do one laser after the other, trying to make 360 degrees, uh, 360 degrees. Uh, and you have to titrate your energy. In the beginning, uh, what we used to do is to go just below threshold. What is the threshold? Threshold is the bubble. It's the small bubbles that you can see. The bubble means that the energy is, uh, the pigment is kind of taking the energy of the of the, the laser and making a bubble. So when it makes a bubble, it's too high. You, have, you want to go one, just one level down. So what do you do? We see few bubbles, we go down, make three, four shots, go up again. If we see more bubbles, then you go a little bit less than, and you keep repeating. Some people, they, they just start with not 0.8, not 0.7, and go 360. So here, as you can see, I'm using a rapid uh, lens, which is easier because I don't have to rotate. I just go in the four quadrants. And after one hour, I usually measure the IOP and just tell the patient to use NSAIDs two times a day for two days. And here, see in the, as you can see in this movie, you don't see much bubbles, but you saw one little bubble down here. And this little bubble was a little bit big and they, it just stayed in place. And why is that? Because it was too much energy. So if your bubble stays and it doesn't do like this, then it's way too much energy. You have to titrate your energy for a lower level. And if you have too much pigment, then you have to start with very low energy, like not four, not five, and just do 180 degrees. So here's the lens I, I was using, which is the, the rapid SLT lens. The advantage is you just go from one mirror to the other. As you can see in the video, it makes life easier. And here is the thing that I were talking about. So remember, this is the single lens, one which I have to rotate. In this case, I may miss a place or even over treat by having one lens, which I can see more, I can just do more in a, in a more sequential way and it's easier to use. Uh, so now we are going to talk very quickly about ALT. ALT, as I've told you, is a mechanic disruption and it's a very small spot size of 50 micras that you are going to place between the pigmented and the non-pigmented turbacular meshwork. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about our ALT because we don't do anymore. And you read that to me. Read that to me. Remember, remember when do we do it? So when you do your gonioscopy exam, you have to ask yourself: Is the trabecular mesh work visible? If it's not visible, why? Because it has a pupil block or because of the ciliary body that's anteriorized? If it's because of pupil block, and that's the importance of indentation then you do it redotomy. If it's because of the ciliary body is anteriorized or the lens is, is the lens hole is way too big, you can go straight to phaco or iridoplasty. And if iridotomy doesn't work, you can either go to phaco or iridoplasty and then phaco. So how does it work? Let's remember here. Here are some 
examples. So here is one example of very, very narrow uh, anterior chamber. You can see by von, von Herrick or even by the indentation as we saw in the previous, uh, in the previous slides. So here when you indent, you can see the trauma trabecular measure. What, what does it mean? That I have to break down this pupil block. And how do I break down this pupil block? I do the redotomy. And to do the redotomy, I'm going to choose where the crits are or where the iris is thinner. Then I do a shot, uh, two, three shots. And see here, this is what you have to see. When you do a shot and it opens like that and you see fluid coming out it means you broke down your uh, the the pupil blockage like here see the the acus coming out here on the other hand what you see is bleeding coming out when you have bleeding that's the advantage of using iridotomy lens some people don't do iridotomy using lens but if you have bleeding uh you just press down your with your lens and this is going to tamponate the, the bleeding and the bleeding is going to stop. Another advantage of using a redotomy lens is because you can magnify the place where you're doing and a redotomy should be done as much to the periphery as possible. And this, see what's happening here. The magnification lens is displaced to the periphery and it gives you a 1.7 seven uh, magnification of the laser beam and see here what happened here it was too thick the iris so i have done alt before to thinner the the iris then they read iridotomy on top of it so this you you could open like that and how to see if it's open afterwards you can see the hole actually the whole or ret retro illumination. We, we want to see both of them. Why? Because sometimes it's difficult to see the retro illumination. Sometimes you see a hole, but it's not complete like you saw in the first video when I did the first shot. It seems that it was open, not open enough. So if the angle doesn't open here, what I'm going to do? I'm going to do iridoplasty. And iridoplasty, basically, it's then one shot after the other, leaving a space between them, about four shots per quadrant. So see here what's happening. Uh, when I do the shots, the actual iris kind of do this movement here, it shrinks and it shrinks, it's going to open the angle. This is not usually done anymore. And why? Because we can do FACO straight. And now we are going to talk very quickly about uh, laser sutilizers. When do you use laser sutilizers? When you do some kind of uh, trap or any kind of uh, glaucoma surgery and you have a high IOP, you have to check if the otome is open, the hole you make is open. If it's open, then it means the suture that it's done is too tight. So you have to 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 uh, to make a suture laser. If it's not open, then you're going to do a gonopuncture. And to do the suture lasers, you you use the Blumenthal um, lens. The Blumenthal lens it's has to be used for for instance for me. Why? Because it's going to magnify here and see here he is a very congested eye has a lot of vessels but when you put the 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 lens here all becomes white blanched and you can see much nicer the 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 suture and then you just shot it and it's going to disperse uh, the the nylon and lay um, now we are going to talk about gonopuncture. So gonopuncture, when do you do? So here is your the whole of your trap, the otomy. And sometimes this can be stuck, can be stuck because it has scarring here, or sometimes because you have herniation. And in these cases, you are going to make uh, um, a shot here using YAG. So for this one, you use the YAG laser and you shot right on the hole. So if you think it's more 
the ice carrying issue, you go just a little further. If you think it's more because of herniation, then you, you bring your machine towards you. Uh, now we are going to go to the last 10 minutes or eight minutes of the presentation, and we are going to talk about surgical gonioscopy. And what statement is not true? I don't need to tilt the microscope to perform surgical gonioscopy. Clear corn incisions may help surgical gonioscopy instead of near clear incisions. Surgical gonioscopy lens should be held with your uh, dominant hand. And the best way to practice surgical gonioscopy is after routine cataract surgery. Most, uh, yeah, 30%. I don't need to till the microscope to perform surgical gonioscopy. And surgical gonioscopy lens should be held with the dominant hand. That's a tricky question. And I'll, I'll tell you. Okay, so for surgical gonioscopy, you have two key concepts location, as I've told you, and visualization. So, as we've seen before, the position of the microscope and the head are essential for a good gonio view. And why is that? Because you have to see temporal to the patient and you have to get used to the microscope tilt. So in this, uh, and this will change according to the microscope you are using. Some microscopes you have to tilt more, some microscopes tilt less. And the more you tilt the microscope, the less you have to tilt the patient head. So get to know your microscope. And in those newer microscopes, you can tilt as much as they can. Just make a, a dot in the microscope to make it easier for your technician. And why should I see temporal? I should see temporal because I'm going to work right opposite to me. I know that most of the collector channels are nasal and inferior to the eye. So if I see temporal, I can get more easily to them. And the head tilts easier sideways. Okay, so you have to see temporal to the patient, get used to the microscope tilt, tilt the patient uh, to the opposite direction and the microscope towards you. And this can make uh, 15 degrees to the microscope and the head 35 to 45 degrees. And about ergonomics, always use coaxial light. When you tilt, the distance between you and the patient becomes greater. So you have to adjust and get used to this. Choose the beds that have a smaller place to uh, to place the head so you stay closer to the eye and keep the arm close to you in this sense it's easier to to do the surgery um, so about ergonomics tilt the head 35 degrees and then tilt the microscope towards you notice when you do that the ocular uh, the ocular becomes lower, and if the ocular becomes lower, you have to, to adjust your sitting position, or you're going to bend, it's going to be very difficult for you to work. So look here, here what's happening. He's positioning the lens, but he can he can he can see the he cannot see the angle very well. So in this case, go one, one more. Uh, if he tilts a little bit more. Uh, the head, it, it becomes much clearer. So sometimes if you don't see the angle, just tilt the head a little bit more. One more. So here uh, you can go all the way down, please. So here's how to prepare to use the lens. So here you have to clean uh, the surface using BSS on the finger. Uh, one more. You have to fill the AC with cohesive. Uh, one more, please. Uh, and always, and to clean the lens, you're going to take the, the lens like this, take your finger and just clean like this, okay? And if you leave your, uh, your OVD vertically, all the bubbles will come up and you, you have a much clearer view. One more, please. Some, some surgical tips, one more. Uh, when you begin doing mixed surgery, try to do a low volume periboba, 
blocked because you have more control of the eye. But if you do so, use your Hunan balloon because the angle is going to get op more open and even use mannitol to, to lower the pressure. One more. Uh, the deeper the chamber, the better the view. One more. So first thing is to check visualization. And if what do you see, it's what you got during clinics. One more. Uh, so try to compare the pigment pattern to the blood, blood reflex. See if you really can see the, the trabecular meshwork. One more. You can use indirect lens, but indirect lens are troublesome. Don't try to use them because if you go up, actually you go down. If you go right, you actually go left. One more. Uh, when you're making your incisions, don't don't do like I'm doing here in uh, in the limbo. Try to do clear corner. Why? Because you have bleeding, and this bleed bleeding is going to mix with the OVD and it's going to make a much worse view. One more. Um, so what's the problem here? And with this lens, I'm pressing too much the, 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 the eye and the incision's too short. So I, I, I lose anterior chamber. And if I lose anterior chamber, I have too much bleeding. So for these uh, eyes, I have to make a longer incision or use lenses that doesn't that doesn't press too much the eye. One more. When that happens, I can make a stitch or one more. I, can you play? Can you press play for me, please? Uh, or you can use this lens, which has this mechanism that it doesn't allow uh, you to kind of press the eye. So see here, it's very gentle to the eye. One more. Uh, so here, um, I'm here is a premium surgery. I'm doing a toric lens. And whenever I'm doing a toric lens, I, I check if I can see the angle first. Then after checking the angle, I can place, uh, uh, after doing the rexis, I can place the, the lens. I tilt the head. I clean my, my lens, my gonial lens with the finger here, just showing you how, how, we, how this mechanism works. See that I can't see much, so I, I have to tilt a little bit more the eye. I tilt a little bit more the eye, and once I put the lens, I can see perfectly the view, as you're going to see right here. So here you can see much nicer. You can see almost all the angle. And just to compare, this is a very nice lens. See, you can adjust the lens and the angle to you, and gives you a a slight different image from the other lens. The other ones is the uh, is also a Vogue lens, is a transcend lens. But I personally prefer the transcend because it doesn't press too much the eye. So once you put the, the lens, you just do your mix surgery. So see why visualization and know where you are, it's essential for all mix procedures. You can go one further. Okay, you, if you don't see the angle, you may dye the angle. If it's too bright, you can put tripen blue. And as you can see here, one more. And how to hold uh, your instrumentation. Always hold the lens with your non-dominant eye because your dominant eye is going to, to hold the instruments. And according to the, to the lens, some have the handle for both left and right-handed, and some has a little bit tilt, uh, like bent handle. One good thing about that lens that I show you, you can adjust the lens to the handle, so you can do like this. And and another answer from the poll is if you don't have to to tilt the head. Actually, if you tilt the head ninety degrees. You, you can see the angle, but it's not convenient for the patient. And we are just finalizing. Next one, please. How to train, how to practice. You Just after your cataract surgery, just go with any kind of hooks, train the distance, train how to position the lens, and try to touch the trabecular meshwork with any kind of hooks. Another one, please. 
So in conclusion, gonioscopy is essential for MIG surgery. It depends on finding the rectal meshwork and having a good view, till the microscope and heads, care with the anesthesia, with the OVD used, and practice at the end of your cataract cases. I would like to thank you. I, I think I, I, I talked a little bit too much. Sorry about the technical issue. I'm not sure what happened to my computer, but I think you could. Dr. Nega from, from Uganda. Is setting the for this means at times a week. So thank you so much for the presentation. I work in Uganda, similar setting to Brazil. There is a limited resource setting. Therefore, this means at times you get high patient loads in such a setting. Is there a screening or recording too that can be used during investigating a patient with the tool, including IOP, fundus, gonioscopy, OCT findings without missing any time and why can't you do it okay uh, that's a very good question so yeah you in high screening uh in places where you have a big bigger population and you need to do screening uh, and this was really used during the pandemic especially from the swedish um, they did a lot of program using virtual uh virtual examinations so in such places you can take handheld uh, devices, such the one I show you, the, the Prestige, for instance, the Prestige is this handheld machine where you can take pictures. You can go to distant places, take these pictures, use some kind of tono pen, tono wire. You, we know it's not the best ones, but you can use it and you can record. And gonioscopy, gonioscopy is the only uh, exam that you actually need to do it. Okay. Uh, nowadays, there is one machine from one brand that does it, but it it uses a lot of light and it touches the eye, so it's going to open. So yes, you can do all these exam exams with handheld machines. And as I shown you, you have some software like the Volk software, it can go all straight to one place, get analyzed from uh, a resource center, and you can get back with the result, uh, the, the results. And Dr. Nader also, also is asking, why can't I do indentation with Goldman? Uh, so remember, the Goldman lens, which is this lens has a very wide contact, uh, a very wide contact place. So this is going to rest in the whole eye. So here you got the eye. It's going to to stay on the all the cornea and a little bit of the limbus. So you can't actually press it. To press and to indent, you need a lens which has a smaller, a, a smaller uh, diameter. If you have a smaller diameter, smaller than the cornea, you press it. And when you press the center, the periphery opens. That's a very good question. Uh, in prophylactic lay, and Dr. Abdulhain, uh, in prophylactic laser radiotomy, a good option for patients with extensive posterior seneca that is not broken if medical treatment. The anterior uvet is under control and IOP is currently low. So to do any kind of surgery or procedures, the uveitis needs to be in control, usually six months before, uh, before doing any surgery. If it's in control, you can do the surgery. So if it's not broken with the laser, if you have synechia, if you have synechia, is it going to help the laser? Not that much. Why? Because the synechia is going to, to stick the iris to the angle. So the broke the channel that you make won't open the periphery. So these cases where it's extensive synechia, you can do either a phaco with synechialysis, but the result varies a lot. Or you can even go 
straight to any kind of glaucoma surgery is as a TREB. Remember, a TREB uh, cuts the iris and it makes a hole between the anterior chamber and subconscious space. So it won't matter if you have Sinica or not. Uh, mm. Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, what's the logic of... Um, Dr. Tulika is asking, what's the logic of using numbing drops for 78 and 90 D exam? It's true, you don't touch the eye, right? So you don't, in theory, you don't need numbing drops, but I prefer because, because it takes long, it sometimes can take more than 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Patients that have glaucoma, they use a lot of drops, of glaucoma drops. And if they use glaucoma drops, most of them, they have dry eye. And if you have dry eye and you have a lot of light coming from this lit lamp, sometimes can be very uncomfortable for the patient to hold the eye open. And by placing them in drops, it's much nicer for the patient and for me because I don't have to, to keep open the, the, the eye for the patient. Uh, which lens is used for the SLT and coupling agent? Good question. The one I showed is the uh, the rapid SLT, the lens which has four mirrors. So if you have four mirrors, like uh, the one I just had here, you can go from one to the, so here. You have, this is the rapid SLT lens. You have four mirrors. You can go from one to the other, to the other, to the other. It's easier. And sometimes if you are not sure, you just, turn slight a little bit. On the other hand, if you're using a three mirror lens, you have to keep rotating, 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 rotating. You have to rotate 360. And this sometimes is not nice for the patient if you have to rotate too much. The coupling agent you can use from gonio cell, which is the OVD or methyl cellulose that we use in Brazil and probably in Africa as well, or any kind of gel. Remember, do, for to do SLT, there is specific lens for SLT, like this one, like one mirror lens. Don't use normal three mirror lens for two reasons. One, the magnification is different. If the magnification is different, the, the energy that you are giving is different from the energy that you should give. And second, a normal three mirror lens is not prepared for laser, so you can actually make some scratch or 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 kind of uh, it, it won't be good for the coating. Uh, okay, yeah. So Alicia is is uh, asking if I use a triple uh, triple burst for your yak pi I, I don't use i just i try to to use just one shot I, I i put in a higher uh energy like six or sometimes even seven and i try to do the least shot that i can because i can't control sometimes uh if you're doing more than one place the focus of the machine is different from what you see and it's very hard to calibrate them. So sometimes the actual shot is just before, just after the focus, because it's not calibrated well. So sometimes you, what you have to do before initiating, you do in a paper, see where the, the shot is, and then do in the eye. And then when you do in the eye, your first shot is the shot to calibrate, to see where your actual energy is going to. If you do a triple shot, and if you are in the wrong position, you're going to get three shots in the wrong position. That's me, okay? Uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, someone someone ask, asked what MIGS stands for. MIGS is minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And my fault, I should have written, that's those new surgeries where it's very similar to a cataract surgery. You use the same incision as a cataract surgery and you work in the trabecular meshwork most of the time. So it's very friendly to the eye and you don't open the conjunctiva and you don't open the sclera 
from outside inwards. You you work inside the eye, and because you work inside the eye, you need some kind of um, uh, gonio view. In SLT, any tips to avoid or to avoid over treatment or under treatment? If the gonial uh, if the gonial lamps I have available in a single mirror lens. So, okay, so George Pons made a very good question. How to avoid uh, over-treatment in a single lens, single mirror lens. So this is a single mirror, this is a three one, but you can imagine it's a single one. If it's a single one, some of the single ones, they have on the opposite direction a mark and you can follow this mark. Uh, so if you do five shots, then you rotate and the mark will go from one place to the other. Then you just follow the mark. So try to always do something cons consistent. So always go, if you go uh, to a single mirror one, take the middle of the, the mirror and do five shots, like one, two, three, four, five. Then turn a little bit, then continue. One, two, three, four, five then can you do over treatment you can it's not guaranteed but i will do that way i used to to use a single mirror in the beginning um okay and alicia thanks again how how often do slt patients needs review after procedure that's a very good question and varies between doctors so uh SLT is still in debate and every school did differently. So as I told you personally, I use NSAIDs for two days and most people don't do any kind of uh, medications afterwards. Some people do uh, steroids for a week. So uh, I usually see the patient one hour after to check for the IOP, especially if they have uh, a lot of pigment. So remember, the higher the pigment, the more in energy used. So the the chance of having a spike is uh, is bigger, is higher. So, uh, so I see for these patients we, which have which have a more pigmented, uh, which have more pigment. I see one day after, one hour after, one day after two weeks after and six weeks after. For normal patients, I only see two weeks after and six weeks after. Why six weeks? Because the laser, remember SLT is a metabolic reaction. It needs time to re reorganize the trabecular meshworks. And what we know that it takes about four to six weeks to lower as much as, as it can the pressure. And after such four to six weeks, I can see if I'm going to retreat or or not. So if a patient comes and I, I didn't get the target that I wanted, so after these weeks, I repeat the laser. But that's me, not what everyone does it. So I think these are all the questions on... Uh, Oh, oh, sorry, there is one last question uh, from Marius. Uh, thank you for the, your question, Marius. Uh, does using steroids after SLT reduce the effects of it? Very good question. In theory, uh, and do you only use NSAIDs after SLT for how long? Okay, that's a very good question. As I just told you, some people do use uh, melasmal uh, steroids after um uh, after SLT, some people use three times a day for five days. I personally don't because uh, what I think it's because it's a, the inflammation that you want and the metabolic reaction that you want, I wouldn't use a uh, steroid. So I prefer to use NSAIDs the least I can for two times a day for two days. Some people don't use at all, but that's not, there is no right or wrong answer for this thank you and very good question thank you for all for watching sorry for the technical issues and sorry for some videos for me they were not playing here